Word, and I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 4 this morning. Matthew chapter 4, in your Bible, uh, we are certainly uh, thankful to have you here with us today as we worship together and as we get ready to look into the Word, and so we want to welcome you here to Lebanon Baptist Church. If you're joining us on our uh, live stream, we want to welcome you as well uh, to our service today. Matthew chapter 4 today. Uh, I want to share with you a uh, message that is something I've been kind of wrestling with for a few years, but I think this is going to be very helpful uh, to us and encouraging to all of us today as we understand the truths that we'll look at today. I've called the message today Identity Theft, and what what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to specifically look at uh, three false identities. We're going to look today at three false identities that Satan tempts every one of us with in order to try and steal our true identity. In Matthew chapter 4, uh, we, we're going to see the temptation of Jesus. We'll see the three temptations that Satan put forth to Jesus that he resisted. And from those three, we'll see those three false identities that Satan tempts every one of us with today as he tries to take away from us our true identity identity. Before we look at Matthew chapter 4, it's important that you see the verse that immediately precedes chapter 4. Look at Matthew chapter 3, and uh, this is at the end of the baptism of Jesus. We're just going to jump right in today. In Matthew chapter 3, right there at the end of the baptism of Jesus in verse 17, uh, maybe back up to 16, when Jesus was baptized, Immediately, it says, he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And verse 17, look at this. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. I really think that like 90% or more of our problems and our stresses and our anxieties and our worries and just the, the complications in life that we bring on ourselves comes from us giving in to one of these three temptations that we're going to look at because we fail to see who we really are in Christ Jesus. Some of you this morning, some of you really, you need to take like by verse 17 right there, And you need to mark in your Bible, this is what God says of me. Where God said, the Father said to Jesus, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Like like some of you are struggling and striving. You've given in to these temptations we're going to look at in a minute. Because you've forgotten that this is who you are. That you are really God's child. That God looks at you because you've put your faith and trust in Jesus and by God's grace and through faith, you, you have become a child of God. And what God sees when he sees you now is this. And this is what he says about you. This is your life's description. This is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Uh, that, that verse ought to be like plastered on your mirror somewhere. You ought to every day when you get up, you ought to remind yourself, this is me. I am a child of God. I am who God says I am. God is well pleased in me. If you'll remind yourself daily of that and remember these three false identities that we're going to look at that Satan tempts us with to try to draw us away from living out of this, I believe we'll be able to live the kind of life that God really intends for us to live. The father said of his son at his baptism before he had done anything. We're going to see that. Like Jesus hadn't done anything yet. As far as we know, he hadn't accomplished anything. He hadn't performed any miracles. There was nothing that Jesus had done at this point in terms of what's recorded for us with his ministry or any of that. As far as we know, he's done nothing. His ministry doesn't begin until after his baptism here. And he's around 30 years old, we believe. And 30 years, nothing to show. And the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. See, Jesus tells us that God says that of every one of us, by his grace, we are God's children through faith. Uh, there's a couple other verses, John 1.12. In John 1.12, you might want to just mark that down, John 1.12. Jesus said, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God. 
Galatians 3, 26 says this, For in Christ Jesus, you, Paul writing to the Galatian believers, he says, For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. This is who you are. This is who we are. Through our faith in Jesus Christ, we have become children of God, and we are individuals that belong to God, that God looks at us and says, this is my beloved son, or this is my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. See, what we're going to see as we look at these is that what we've got to do as well is we've got to fight back and push back against these three temptations that Satan comes at us with, in order to find our true identity in Christ, because each of these three temptations is really Satan's way of screaming at us three things. If you're taking notes on the back of the bulletin, Satan, when he tempts us with these that we're going to look at, are his way of saying to us and screaming at us, God's love is not enough. See, right after Jesus received this affirmation from the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, right out of that, he was tempted by Satan, that's not enough. You're going to, we're going to see those. Every time Satan tempts us with these false identities, these temptations that he comes at us with to try to live one identity apart from the identity that we have in Christ, it is him screaming at us, God's love is not enough. You are not lovable. You will never be good enough. This is Satan. You're going to see, Satan tempts us. You'll see, like, you struggle with these. We wrestle with these every day, I promise you, every single day. If you walk outside of your house or if you wake up in the morning, you don't have to go outside. Just wake up. You are going to battle with these three temptations that we're going to look at. And each one of them is Satan screaming at you, God's love is not enough. You are not lovable. You will never be good enough. Say, what are these? Look at the temptations. Look at the temptations that Jesus faced. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, see, this is an identity issue here. If you really are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus resisted this first temptation. Then verse 5, Then the devil took him uh, to the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple, probably the busiest place, up on the high part, the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, uh, again, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, he'll command his angels concerning you. Uh, and on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus resisted this temptation, saying again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Here comes the third. And again, it says, the devil took him to a very high mountain and and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus resisted this again by saying to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. I found that these three temptations are things that we struggle with. These are the same three things I think Satan tempts every one of us with on a daily basis. Say, what are these three temptations? Well, Satan tempts us to believe three lies, the, the same three that he put forward to Jesus. He tempts us to believe these same three lies, and every day we, we battle with our identity. Am I going to live today in my identity as a child of God in whom the Father is well pleased? Or am I going to pursue one of these fake identities that Satan is putting in front of me because I've believed the lie that this is who I have to be? The first lie is this. Satan tempts us to believe I am what I do. And it's about performance. 
this is the first lie that I think <clears throat> Satan tempts Jesus with. Uh, you know, he comes to him there in verse uh, 3, and, he, you know, the tempter came and said, if you are the Son of God, uh, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So what is, what's at this temptation? I mean, uh, well, one, we know it's a, you know, he's being tempted to fulfill a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. You know, use your power for yourself. Use, if you're God's child, use that for yourself. Don't use that for the Father. It's a temptation to, yes, to, to use his power to fulfill a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. I mean, most of the sins that we give into are our attempts to fulfill something legitimate that we desire, but doing it in an illegitimate way way and yes that is what's going on here but it's also I think about the fact that Jesus hasn't done anything yet hey you're 30 do something you're still like you're still living in your mom's basement you're 30 years old I mean Satan comes to Jesus and he says do something Jesus you haven't done anything for 30 years now his ministry had not yet started he had just been baptized I mean Jesus seems like a loser at this point. Nobody believes in him yet. I mean, if you're the son of God, like, at least turn these stones into bread. Like, do something. Like, perform some miracle. If you really are the son of God, do something. See, you're nothing unless you do something. If you can't perform, then you are worthless. You're useless. You're of no value. Satan ultimately comes to Jesus and he tempts him with this this question that he, he tempts every one of us with like what contribution have you made to society you haven't done anything Jesus if you are the son of God just turn these stones into bread like just come on do something it's a it's a temptation to believe the lie that we're not God's child with whom he's well pleased no we are what we do we are what we do what do we most often talk about when people come up and, uh, hey, what do you do? What do you do? You know, uh, and, and, and sometimes you, you tell them, and then other times, you, you, you know, you don't, or you change the title a little bit, depending upon the context. You know, like if I'm around somebody and they just seem hostile towards God, I probably won't tell them I'm a youth pastor. You know, or, you know, when I was a youth pastor, I wouldn't say I'm a youth pastor. Or, you know, now that I'm a pastor, I'm not going to say I'm a pastor. You know, like, eh, you know uh, well, you know, I, I'm in ministry. You know, just try to soften it a little bit. You know, we, we oftentimes when we get around, we meet new people, what's the question that comes up? Like, what, who, what do you do? What do you do? And, and most of the time when we describe ourselves, tell me something about yourself. Well, you know, I work at, you know, we, we start with what we do. We have kind of bought this lie that life is only valuable, that we are only valuable if we do, th if we do something, if we have something to show for ourselves because we've bought this lie that we're, we're, we are what we do. It's about performance. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, movie, but uh, there's an interesting movie. Uh, it goes by uh, the title Amadeus. Amadeus. Anybody seen Amadeus? A few of you have seen that? All right. We got, we got several in here. So uh, in this movie, all right, how many of you have never seen this movie before? You have no idea. All right, good, good. At least, all right, that's good. So uh, th this movie is... Uh, you know, set like in the 18th century, and, and, and it's about uh, the most famous, one of the most famous composers in the world, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And so uh, the way it kind of goes, though, is the guy on your right there is this famous composer in Vienna named Antonio, what is it? Salieri, yes, Salieri, Antonio Salieri. And so he's this famous composer. He's in the court. He's in the royal court. He's the court composer. And he's the most famous. He's the most well-known. Uh, he, he is the composer of the day. But then along comes this guy named Mozart. And he becomes more popular, more famous. People seem to like his stuff more. And uh, really what happens is throughout the whole movie, Antonio, Sca Antonio Salieri is... is envious of Mozart and the whole movie is Salieri believing that God loves Mozart more than he loves him because he's blessed Mozart with the talents to be able to compose from his mind without having to write it out and his whole 
this whole movie is, is, is Salieri believing that God doesn't love him, that he loved Mozart more than him because he could not do the things that Mozart could do. And it's, it ultimately, ultimately it wrecks his life. It wrecks his life because he couldn't perform the way Mozart could perform. There's sort of this dramatic uh, kind of climactic point in the movie where, where uh, Salieri, uh, he, he, he receives some of the, the compositions, the original compositions of Mozart because Mozart's wife goes to Salieri secretly and brings him some of this stuff and says, look at it. And, you know, Mozart will not give it to anybody. Look at it. He, he, we need to make some money here. You know, look at his stuff and see if it's any good. And, and, and Salieri begins looking at it, and he's reading through it, and he's just like, he's, he's just overwhelmed by the fact there are no corrections at all. And he realizes Mozart has composed all of this in his mind, and then he has just written it down from memory instead of having to go through the process that he struggles with. When he was a boy, he had prayed, Salieri had prayed and asked God to allow him to be able to compose and let him be the greatest composer so that he could use that gift for God. And ultimately, here came someone who could do it better, and it ruined his life. And ultimately, his dream was to see how he could kill Mozart and then be the one who would play and perform his composition at Mozart's funeral. Uh, the, scene, the movie opens. I want you to see this because the movie opens... With the movie opens with Salieri as an old man in a psychiatric hospital, and the priest comes to visit him. And at the beginning of the movie, he kind of tells a little bit here about this struggle. The whole movie is set with him retelling the story to this priest as he's sort of making his confession. I want you to see this is just a glimpse at what becomes of us when we live this life of performance based identity. Take a look at this. soul in pain. Do you know who I am? That makes no difference. All men are equal in God's eyes. Are they? Offer me your confession. I can offer you God's forgiveness. How well are you trained in music? I know a little. I, I studied it in my youth. Where? Here in Vienna. Ah, then you must know this. I can't say that I do. What is it? It was a very popular tune in its day. I wrote it. Here. How about this? This one brought down the house when we played it first. Regret it is not too familiar. Can you recall no melody of mine? I was the most famous composer in Europe. I wrote 40 operas alone. Here. Yeah. What about this one? Yes, I know that. Oh, 
that's charming. I'm sorry, I didn't know you wrote that. I didn't. That was Mozart. Wolfgang. Amadeus. Mozart. The man you accuse yourself of killing. You've heard that? Is it true? God's sake, my son. If you have something to confess, do it now. Give yourself some peace. You. Was my idol. Um, the uh, kind of beginning there was he tried to take his own life and that's how he wound up there I don't know how true to life how true or accurate the movie is but um, believing and living ourselves living our lives from the lie that we are what we do is good so long as someone doesn't come along that does it better it's a terrible lie to live our lives by. We're not what we do. Our culture presses us with these questions today. What have you achieved? What have you done? What do you do? Most of us consider ourselves worthwhile only if we've accomplished something. When we realize we don't have much to show for our accomplishments, or we realize someone else has more to show, we slip into depression out of shame, or we begin to blame other people for our lack of accomplishment. Earthly success may be great, but it tempts us to find our worth and our value outside of God's inexhaustible, free love for us in Christ. The second temptation is to believe the lie that Satan tempts us with, I am what I have, and that it's about possessions. I want to skip over the second temptation, move to the third, then come back to the second. In verses 8 and 9, it says that um, the devil took Jesus up to a high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. What was Satan saying to Jesus there and what does Satan say to every one of us? He says, everybody who's anybody has something. Like you're nobody if you don't have anything. And Satan is saying to Jesus, look at all these kingdoms of the world. If... If you are who you say you are, you ought to have something. Like, you don't have anything. In our world and our culture, and Satan tempts us today to believe that we are what we have, and we are the abundance of our possessions means that we're somebody. And if we don't have much, then we're not much. This is a terrible lie to live as well, to believe that we are what we have, and to live our lives constantly grabbing for more possessions because we think that we're going to find fulfillment and satisfaction in that. Uh, there's a, a great book that I'm kind of reading through right now. Don't go buy it just yet because uh, we're going to do this uh, through the summer uh, with, on Sunday nights uh, with our Titus 2 talks this year. We're going to go through this book. But uh, it's a book called The Practice of Godliness by Jerry Bridges. And I just recently read the chapter. He talked about contentment, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, where it says godliness with what? Contentment is great gain. He talks about uh, the, the need for contentment and how God has a certain attitude towards uh, our greed and our discontent over the things that we have. And, and, and he points to uh, three examples in the scriptures, two in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. The two in the Old Testament is the story of Achan, where he took the things that didn't belong to him, and then Gehazi, where he went and lied and, and was greedy to get more possessions, and then Ananias and Sapphira and how they lied about some of their possessions and kept back some and and he says this he says um, God's attitude toward discontentment has not changed and the spiritual danger of loving the things of this world is far more serious than the judgment of a dreaded disease or an untimely death kind of coming from uh, 
coming from those examples in Scripture. Uh, our culture and Satan is really good today at tempting us to be discontent, right? We are, we are constantly bombarded with messages that we shouldn't be content. Our culture says don't be content with what you have, right? Don't be content with what you have. It's advertising, you know, everywhere we go, telling us that what we have is not enough. We need to learn to pray the prayer that the psalmist prayed in Psalm 119, turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve, preserve my life according to your word. Like we need to, re if you struggle with discontentment over the things that you have, then you need to plaster this somewhere and just remind yourself and pray daily, God, please turn my heart away from everything that Satan and the culture tries to tempt me with, from selfish gain, from worthless things, and, and preserve my life according to your word. We have to learn to pray that. To us, Satan says, you are if you own. You are if you own. You know, marketers today spend now over $15 billion annually just at advertising directed toward children and adolescents to teach them that they have to believe or to teach them that they, they have to have certain clothes, certain toys, or certain electronics in order to be somebody. Their very identity depends upon it. $15 billion annually to try to seduce our kids and our adolescents, our teenagers, our young adults, to try to seduce us to believe the lie that we have to have certain things in order to have value and worth and to be somebody. That's the message that Satan tempted Jesus with. It's the message that he tempts us with. We want the most money. Like we're tempted today, you know, we need to have the most money. We're tempted today to, uh, you know, to strive to possess, uh, to have the most beautiful body, uh, to have the most money, to have the most beautiful body. I mean, you can look around, though, and see most of the men in our church haven't struggled with that uh, temptation. But, but we're tempted we're tempted to have the most beautiful body, the most comfortable life, to get the best education, to have the most awards, to have the best looking boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife. Like we're tempted to have these possessions. I mean, why is it that we strive and work so hard to get all these possessions that are all just a little bit more out of reach? And I see people constantly ruining their lives because they're constantly going after and getting things that are just a little bit more out of their reach. And it causes all this stress and anxiety and worry causes them to, to have no margin in their life, causes them to live lives that are frantic, and then causes them to ultimately be depressed when they can't handle everything that they've gotten for themselves that they can't afford. Why? Because we've bought the lie that we are what we possess. Satan has tempted us, and we believed him, and we followed that. Listen, I have yet to find, I have yet to find satisfaction and fulfillment in a pair of shoes. Like, I mean, think about it. I've yet to find satisfaction and fulfillment in a pair of shoes. I mean, except for like maybe that one pair like a week and a half ago that Zion was wearing in that Duke Carolina game. Maybe that pair of shoes, but, but other, other than that, other than that, like for me, okay? I just, I, I couldn't resist. Um, sorry. We are not what we own. We are more than that. We're a child of God, and God is well pleased with us, not based upon what we do, not based upon our possessions. The third lie that Satan tempts us to believe is that we are what others think. We are what others think. This is what he says to Jesus. He goes to Jesus. He says, do something. Prove yourself. You haven't done anything. Perform. He goes to Jesus says, look at all the kingdoms of the world. You don't have anything. You're nobody if you don't have something. So go get something. Do something. Do something. Get something. Hey, and then he comes to him and he says, nobody even believes in you yet. He takes him up in verses 5 and 6 to the pinnacle, the holy city, to the pinnacle of the temple. One of the busiest places there would have been people everywhere. And he says, throw yourself down from this high point in front of all these people. Just launch yourself down. And what will happen? He, then Satan uses scripture. Because he's very good at doing that. He takes God's word and he twists it just like he did in the garden. 
And he takes God's word and he says, hey, remember, uh, the scripture says that God will send his angels. They won't even let you hurt your precious little foot. God will send his angels to catch you up so that you won't hurt yourself. He says, throw yourself down. What he does is he comes to Jesus and he says, nobody even knows who you are. Nobody knows you. Throw yourself down in front of all these people. The angels will catch you. Then people will recognize this is somebody special. See, you're nobody if people don't follow you. You're nobody if people don't think well of you. Nobody really knows you yet. They don't know you're the Son of God. They don't believe in you. You are somebody if you are popular. Everyone will see that you're rescued, and finally you'll be somebody because everyone will think that you're special. Satan tempts us with this message today. He, teach, he tempts us with the lie that we are what other people think. Forget that you're a child of God and God is well pleased with you. Forget that. That doesn't matter. No, you are what other people think of you. We live life today believing this lie that we are what other people think. Many people live their whole life trying to just barely meet the unrealistic expectations of a domineering, controlling father. And their whole life, they believe they're only worth something if their dad thinks something well of them. And so they, they, they struggle through all of life trying to meet unrealistic expectations of a father. Or, or, or they strive and fight so hard in life just to prove everybody wrong. Like, that's their motto. Like, I am what other people think, and, you know, a lot of these people don't think I can do it, so I'm going to do it just to prove them wrong. You ever heard people talk like that? Because they believe the lie that they are what others think. Or we present, constantly we present a version of ourselves on social media so that we can be liked and we can be favorited and we can be retweeted. Why? Because we believe we are what other people think. We say yes. We say yes to more invitations than we can handle because we don't want to let anyone down because we care what people think. We buy things we cannot afford to impress people because we think, you know, we are what other people think. Why is it that if you ride through, if you drive through uh, some of the poorest neighborhoods, you'll see some of the most expensive cars in the driveways? You ever wondered that? Like, why is it when you, you go through some, some of the poorest neighborhoods, you see some of the most expensive cars? Because they, they're, they're, the people that they, that they come into contact with, they'll see what they drive. They may never go to their home, but they'll see what they drive. And so it matters more what other people think of them. And they can put forth that image by driving a certain vehicle because they've bought the lie that I am what others think. I really believe like 90% of our problems and our anxieties and our stress and worry come because we believe one of these three lies and or we believe all three of them or we follow them at different points and times in our life we've got to learn to resist these three temptations they're just satan's way of screaming at you god's love is not enough you're not lovable hey you're not going to be good enough forget these lies and resist these lies from satan and remember verse 17 this is my beloved child in whom i am well pleased Back in the 20s, 1920s, when Babe Ruth was uh, playing baseball for the, the greatest team that he ever played for, uh, the Yankees, uh, he was at bat one time, and an interesting story, that was a jab at the Red Sox, and like since, you know, nobody picked it up, I, you know, I just realized, uh, I realized I needed to come back and make a little joke there, because it matters what you think and if you didn't think that was funny it was going to hurt my feelings all day and so anyway it was it was, it was true anyway when, when Ruth was playing for the uh <clears throat> when he was playing in a, in a game there at New York at Yankee Stadium and uh he was up to bat it was kind of a crucial point in the game and he was stepping up to bat and uh, the umpire uh for the game was also uh Babe uh was Babe Pirelli and uh, the story is told that uh, Babe Ruth steps up to bat, and he steps up, and he, he steps into the batter's box, and he gets lined up, he gets set, and the first pitch comes in, and it's a little outside, and Pirelli calls it strike one. 
and all the fans kind of start to boo a little bit. You know, and, and Ruth kind of shakes his head a little bit, you know, and he steps back in, and he gets ready, and he gets set, and the next pitch comes in, and, and it's a little further outside. And Pirelli this time, again, strike two. And the fans this time, man, they 50,000 fans let him have it. Boo! And so, you know, Ruth steps back and lets the fans boo a minute, and then he kind of looks over at Pirelli, and he says, Hey, Pirelli. There's 50,000 fans here that know that last pitch was a ball, not a strike. And he gets ready to step back in, and Pirelli says, Ruth, there may be 50,000 fans here that think that last pitch was a ball, not a strike, but my opinion is the only one opinion that counts. Uh, I want to say that to you as we close today. Listen, 50,000 people may have opinions about you, there's only one opinion that counts. 50,000 people may have opinions of you. There's only one opinion that counts. That is the opinion of your Father in heaven who sent his son Jesus Christ to die for your sins on the cross and that in Christ he can say through faith you are his child. You are his beloved with whom he is well pleased, apart from anything you do or have or what anybody else thinks. you got to live your life out of that statement and out of the love that God has for you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? With your heads bowed and eyes closed as the band comes to prepare <coughs> for a closing him of invitation I just want to encourage you listen we, this is a constant battle this is a constant battle because of the culture in the world that we live in because of the way that Satan has used our culture to tempt us daily this is a battle I just want to encourage you when we sing this morning I, I want to invite you to, to come we, we don't always make up a, a big push at the end of a message to, for you to respond but but I know that this is a big deal for many of us, and, and it's only been in the last two or three years that I've really come to realize these concepts. It's, it's, not, it's not what I do. It's not what I have. It's not what other people think. It, it really, what matters at the end of the day is what God thinks. And I've got to live out of his love for me. I've got to live my life out of that, not out of an effort to prove everybody wrong or to have the most accomplishments or... or, or uh, to get popular, anything like that. It's not about that. It, it is about living out of the love that God has for us and for me. And we've got to learn to do that. I want to encourage you as we, as we sing in just a minute, if you want to come and just say, Father, please remind me. Thank you for this today. Thank you for this reminder and this truth that you are pleased with me as your child and that I got to live from that identity as a child of, of yours. You know, just come and pray and ask for his help with that. We have to battle these temptations daily. I want to encourage you to just come and pray and thank the Lord for what he has done. Thank God for what he says about you and how he speaks to you daily. You know, we think, wouldn't it be great if a voice came from heaven, if the heavens opened up and we heard a voice from heaven today saying, this is my beloved child with whom I'm well pleased? You think, wouldn't that be great if a voice from heaven came down today saying that? And yet, that voice from heaven has come down through the pages of the scripture, and God has said, you are a child of God through your faith. You are a child of God. It's come down. He said that of you. Would you worship him today and live from that? Father, Father, we praise you today. We thank you, Lord, for your, your greatness and your majesty, and we thank you, Father, for what you say of us. We thank you, Father, that that truly lasting fulfillment and satisfaction won't be found in anything here that we could get or do or what others would say or think. Lasting satisfaction and fulfillment is found in our identity in Christ. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that today as we sing and as we worship you, that you would help us to, re to just remember that we are who you say we are. And you would help us to build our lives on the true that we are your child and you are well pleased with us. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that has not 
place their faith in Jesus. John 1 says, to as many as receive him, he gave that right to become children of God. If we haven't received you, we haven't received through our faith the, the gift that you have offered to us, then we're not in that position yet. We need to trust Christ and be saved and become your children today. Lord, we glorify you and we pray and we lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's worship. And if you need to come or would like to come and thank and praise the Lord or pray for him.